Good evening, everyone. We are continuing Gemara Masechah Brachot, and we left off in a cliffhanger. We left off last week with the age-old question of why do good things happen to bad people, and why do bad things happen to good people? Except when we asked the question, we actually said how there was there was two more point, point, uh, parts to the question: why do good things happen to good people, and bad things happen to bad people? You need to ask all four. So tonight we are going to we will go back a few lines, give ourselves a running start. We'll pick up with that question. We will show see that the Gemara gives us three answers. The Gemara will give us three answers, and there are plenty more answers than that. But this is not going to be a philosophy class. We'll discuss it briefly through the framework of the three answers, and then we're going to move on. There's really a lot to a lot to cover. So that's a uh, That's the question. This question of why do good things happen to good people? Good things happen to bad people. Bad things happen to good people, and bad things happen to bad people. Let's go. We'll pick up from where we uh, just go back a few lines in the art scroll. It's seven a four in the left column. Three things. We said that uh, we actually, and with that, I'll just also share my screen and show that last last week we were going through the statements of Rabbi Yochanan in the name of Rabbi Yosef. So Rabbi Yochanan in the name of Rabbi Yosef said one statement, and then we went on a chain of five of his statements. Statement number one is the fact that Hashem prays. We spoke about what he prays about, that he wants his mercy to overcome his anger. Uh, over, uh, number two is not to appease someone while they are angry. You have to give them time to cool off. We spoke about that. The third thing we spoke about, regret penetrating the heart is more power, more powerful than physical pain. Meaning if someone were to get whipped, uh, to try to get whipped into shape, then that may not be effective. The person might continue doing bad things. But if someone gets whipped in the heart, meaning they take it to heart, they take it seriously, that's more effective. That was the third statement. The fourth statement was that Moshe Rabbeinu had three requests from Hashem. We did all three. But now let's go give ourselves a running start. Go back to 784, Dav Aleph, and I'll put it on the screen. And uh, let's go. There are three requests that Moshe had in front of God, and Hashem gave him all three. He asked for three things, and he got the answer for all three. Number one, he requested that Hashem be with us. Hashem's presence be with us. What does this mean? This means after the sin of the golden calf, God said, I'm not coming with you in your, on your journey in the desert anymore. You go on your own. You could have my angel. Whatever this means, it means that Hashem is re removing himself. However, Moshe Rabbeinu asks, no, Hashem, you come with us. And Hashem says, yes. Second thing, and we, we did all of the psukim last week. You have to come with us. That's what his request was, and Hashem said yes. He also requested that Hashem should be exclusive with Am Yisrael. Of course, Hashem is the God and creator of the entire universe and all mankind. But he, Moshe Rabbeinu said, you're going to be with us, and please make that an exclusive or elevated relationship, not just like any, any other nation. And Hashem gave it to him. You will separate and distinguish me and your nation, okay? Now, question number three. He asked God to understand his ways. And Hashem explained it to him. He asks Hashem, please show me your ways. And what that means is, help me to understand the patterns of how you interact with this world. This is the question. Amar lefanav. He said in front of him, "Ribono shalom, Master of the Universe. Mipnei ma? Why is it yesh tzadik v'tovlo? Yesh? Why is it that there's a good, there's a, a righteous person that good things happen to him? Yesh tzadik v'ralo, and there's a righteous person that bad things happen to him. Yesh rasha v'tovlo. There are wicked people that bad thing, that good things happen to that person. So wicked person, but good things happen to him. He has good fortune. Yesh rasha v'ralo." And then there are wicked people that bad things happen to him. So as we mentioned this uh, in the intro, and we also mentioned this last week, usually the way people ask the question is, why do bad things happen to good people? Or good things happen to bad people? Andrew said it in a very nice way before we started the shiur. He said, there's two types of questions. And I think this is, a, is very beautifully put. There's two ways of asking a question. One is when I'm trying to attack, I'm trying to uh, interrogate or 
ask you a question because what you're doing doesn't make sense. I'm challenging what you do. And the other one is, I'm curious. I'm asking for information. Those are two types of questions. One, it could be a tacking question. Another one could be an informational question. If the question is, why do good things happen to bad people and bad things happen to good people? That's an attacking question. Because what it's saying, right? This is the what you were explaining. What it's saying is, I understand why good things happen to good people and bad things happen to bad people. God, I agree with you. I agree with you. When you do this part, I agree. When you do this part, I agree. When you do that and that, I don't really agree. Why are you doing that? Like, who asked for your agreements? So when, when a person asks a question of why do bad things happen to good people and good things to bad, it's saying, Hashem, I understand part of what you do, and I don't understand, and I'm attacking because it doesn't make sense, right? This is like an attacking way. Whereas the way the Gemara asked it is Moshe Rabbeinu came in with humility saying, I'm not attacking, I'm asking. If I would see only bad things, oh, 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 bad things happening only to bad people or good things happening to good people, I would, okay, I would say I understand there's a pattern. If I would see the opposite, if I would see good things happening to bad people, bad things happening to good people, but it was always consistent, there's a pattern. What I don't understand is that, that it's patternless. Sometimes a good person, good things happen. Sometimes bad things. Sometimes a bad person, good things happen. Bad things happen. So I don't understand. Explain it all. It's not an attack on God. It's a help me to understand what's going on under the hood. Peeling back the curtain to explain your ways. Okay, that was his question. And now, answer number one. Remember, there's going to be three answers. Answer number one. Oh, I'm giving you a cliffhanger again. Okay, what is going on here? Okay, want to change your translation? Now I'm good. Okay, let's do this. Answer number one, and keep in mind, there are going to be three answers, and we'll discuss each one. Amar lo. Hashem responds. Number one, Moshe. Sadiq betov lo, Sadiq ben Sadiq. If it's a righteous person that is experiencing good fortune, good things are happening, that means he's a righteous person, the son of a righteous person, meaning... There's a whole, another piece of the formula and that has to do with the person's parents. Tzadik, betov lo tzadik, ben tzadik. That means this person is righteous and the parents are righteous. The father is righteous. Tzadik, veralo, if it's a righteous person and bad things are happening to them, tzadik, ben rasha. It's because the father was improper. The father was wicked. The wa father was deserving of, of uh, punishment. So now the son gets it. Rasha, betov lo, if it's a wicked person, but good things are happening to him, Rasha ben Sadiq. That means he's wicked, but his father is a righteous person, so he's getting rewarded. Rasha Veralo, if it's a wicked person and bad things are happening to him, Rasha ben Rasha. He's wicked, his father is wicked, so therefore bad things are happening to him. Okay? So essentially, the first answer of the Gemara is Moshe, you're looking at one dimension. Your dimension is the behavior of this person. And you're saying if it's righteous, it should be good if he's not righteous. If he's wicked, it should be bad. But no, there's a second dimension, and that's the previous generation. If you have a righteous person, but his father is wicked, so that's why you'll have a tzaddik uh, veralo. You'll have bad things happening to him. And if he's if he's both righteous and his father's righteous, that's why he's a tzaddik vetovlo. Good things happening to him. Yes, question. This is the, the, the first answer, Brita. Yes, this is the first answer. Yes, this is the Brita. Gives the first answer. Correct. Correct. God said it to Moshe, but we are quoting. Actually, sorry. Go back. Go back. Go back. Go back. This is Rabbi Yochanan, Mishim Rabbi Yosef. This is a statement of Rabbi Yochanan. So Rabbi Yochanan, in the name of Rabbi Yosef, is saying this. Moshe Rabbeinu asked for three things. I said right now. It's Rabbi Yochanan, Mishim Rabbi Yosef. It's part of his chain of statements. Um, he asked for three things, and he got the answer for three things. He asked Hashem be with us, and Hashem said yes. He said Hashem be only with us and not with Ovdei Kochavim, the idol worshippers, Hashem said yes. He said, explain to me your ways, and Hashem said okay, and he explained to him. And the Gemara then goes on and tells him what the answer is. The answer is, a righteous person that bad things are happening to is because he's a righteous person, the son of a wicked person. Correct. Correct. He's he's not finding the source of this in the Pasuk. He's, he's explaining what he believes is the answer. The question he sources, the answer he's not sourcing. Very good. Very good that you're picking it up. But the Gemara, okay, so so far so good. So answer number one is what? Parents. Very good. Father. That's answer number one. The Gemara now will reject the first answer and say that the, the first answer, there is a 
Um, there's a there's a philosophical issue there, or there's an issue with the answer. Let's see what the answer is. Okay. So Amar Mar, Master said, meaning we're now recording you. You said that's the answer. Tzadik v'tovlo, tzadik ben tzadik. Right? It's just this is recording. You're saying a tzadik v'tovlo, uh, tzadik that good things happen to him is a tzadik ben tzadik. Tzadik v'ralo, tzadik ben rasha. It's a tzadik that tz the bad things are happening to him is because his father is a rasha. Ini, is that really the case? Can that be? Is that fair for a person to be punished by the parents? So before we read it, tell me what you think. Is it fair for a person to be punished for his father's sin? Yeah, very good, very good. So, uh, okay. Uh, okay. Yeah, that's so all right. Okay, very good. So this is exactly what the question of the Gemara is going to be. Very good. So, Iran, you're actually saying how there's a pasuk that says that Hashem will punish the children. Yeah, you're quoting a pasuk that says that Hashem will. So that's very good. So you brought a scriptural source. Everyone else I asked, is it fair? And you're saying no. Does anyone think it is fair? Iran brings me a pasuk, which is good. Does anyone think it's fair for a child to be punished for account of, on account of their father's sin? Only if he continues in his father's wicked ways. Okay, okay, very good, Andy. You're saying if he continues in his father's wicked ways. But if he continues... Okay, so, Andy, I have a question for you. If he continues in his father's wicked ways, then he's getting punished for his wicked ways. Why does he have to get punished for his father also? That's a good... Well, he has the chance. He, he, maybe... Let's, uh, the father doesn't know what he's doing is wicked, but if the son knows what the father did is wicked and continue okay. in the father's ways. Okay. Okay, very even good. Though ignorance is not an excuse, but very, very common good. in our religion. Very good. Very good. Okay. Yes. Uh huh. Okay, so you're you're raising a good question. How sometimes there are punishments that a person's child will die. There's in fact there's this concept called ariri, or a person's child will die in their lifetime. Shalonada, shalonada. We spoke. We actually got a little bit into this in our Gemara also about someone's child children dying might be considered yisurin shalahava for the parent, right? So yes, okay. You're you're saying how there is this concept of sometimes someone getting punished by their children. Uh, getting hurt for them. So you're saying how you see here's another proof of Tanakh that is possible. So let's go ahead and see the Gemara. Yeah, I want, you had a question? Or no? No, no, yes, go ahead. Okay. Okay, so you're saying you're saying something else. You're what? Okay, you're you're bringing a very good point, but you're saying no one is a full tzaddik, right? So that actually, I'm going to ask you to park because that's going to be the next answer of the Gemara. At this point, we're not questioning whether the person is a tzaddik or not. We're saying the person is completely righteous, but even though the person is completely righteous, the father is wicked, and therefore this person who is completely righteous will get some punishment. That's what the Gemara's assumption is for this first answer. You're saying something about, is there really such a thing as completely righteous? That's going to be the second answer. So very good. Very good thought. But at this point, for the first answer, yeah, the person is a complete righteous person. Or flip case, the person is a rasha, terrible person, but his father was a righteous person. So he has the chutavot and he's going to get some good things happening to him. Is that fair? Does anyone think it's fair for someone who's completely, completely wicked, but his father is righteous, that he should get some good blessings? I think it should be the other way around. Like the you father, should, should, the father should be judged on how the, like the child turns out. Why should the student be penalized for how the teacher teaches them? Okay, okay, very good. He's he's, he's like uh, turning this around on me. Why should I? Why should I be penalized for what you're doing? What <laughs> yeah. Okay. Okay. Very good. Very good. So Rani brings a good point that's saying. Really, really, who should be responsible for the way the child behaves is the parent. The parent is the one that raised the child. So Rodney's bringing up a good point that he thinks it's not fair that the child gets the father's punishment. Really, the father should get punished for the way the child misbehaves. 
or if behaves, if the child behaves correctly, then the father should get some pride from that. Very good. So it should really go, Ronnie's Rani, making a good point. Just go in the opposite direction. Very good. Very good. And now you were saying of why it should be the case that maybe uh, of a righteous person who has a child that's wicked, that the wicked person should still get some good fortune. You wanted to comment on that? Right. Yeah, so he has a zechut avot. His father raised him in the right way. He went off, but Okay, you might be able to say the opposite. Though. You might say how, you might say how. Look, he should have. He, you know, he had the best education in the world. Okay, very good. You have one more point, then we'll move on. Yeah. So it's good both of wicked and good, but Hashem decides to be wicked and only a little wicked, yeah. very wicked. So they get they get a reward. Okay, so again, again, you're you're with Elon. You're you're questioning. That you're giving another answer. The Gemara asks, why do good things happen to good people, bad things, and good things happen to bad, bad to good, bad to bad? The Gemara said, it depends on who is the parent. You're saying, no, it depends on the person. That's going to be the next answer. The next answer is going to be whether someone is completely a tzaddik or not, or completely wicked or not. But at this answer, we're not questioning the person's righteousness or the person's wickedness. We're asking, they're saying there's a connection to the parents. Let's get through this answer and we're going to come to that as well. Okay, let's keep going. Wait, you, you asked four questions on this one thing. Yeah. No, I was just talking about that. I was just saying that just the righteous person, the son of a not righteous person, should be on a higher level. Than right. Than right, right, right. A righteous person, the son of a wicked person. Why is he getting punished for his parent? If anything, he changed the ways of his parent. It's so much more difficult for him. Okay, very good. Okay, so we see all of the issues with this. Now let's see the question of the Gemara. V'haketiv, is that really the case? V'haketiv, it says in the Torah, Poket avon avot al banim. This is the pasuk that Liran was quoting for us. That Hashem says that he will take the, pun the sins of a father and put it on the child, meaning that he'll punish the child for it. Uchtiv, but there is another pasuk in Devarim that says, Ubanim children will never be punished for the sin of their father. It's a pasuk that says, each, each person will be punished for their own sin. A child will never be punished for the sin of the father. And we now have a contradiction between two psukim. So, as we are questioning whether a child should be punished for the sin of the father, really we're opening up two separate psukim, one pasuk says that Hashem will carry the sin over to the child and punish the child for the sin. There's another pasuk that says that he won't. Okay, so before we even talk about Rabbi Yochanan's answer, you have two pasukim in the Torah that are saying different things. Which one is it? So the Gemara says, I'll explain to you. Umishanina, the Gemara answers. This is Gemara Maseret Sanhedrin. Lo kashia. It's not a, it's not a contradiction. Ha, it depends. This is what Mr. Andy Vesali said. It depends if the children continue in the wicked ways of the father, then the child will get the punishment for the father also. It becomes cumulative. It almost becomes like a hot streak. If you have second generation bad, so you get two generations worth of punishment. Third generation bad, three generations worth of punishment. It's a, it goes, when they continue the actions of their children, of their fathers. And the children will be punished for the sin of the father. But, if the child breaks away from the ways of his parent and then he becomes good, he will not get punished for the sin of his father ever. So now, what do you see from this answer? That a child who is a tzaddik, the son of a rasha, will never get punished for the sin of the father. Okay? I'm going to come back to this in a second. But let's just see what happened here. The first answer was, why do good things happen to bad people, etc.? Well, it depends on who the parent is. If the parent is a bad person, so the righteous person will get punished. The Gemara says, hold on a second. I have two psukim. One of them says, children will get punished for the parent. The other one says, children will not get punished for the parent. And what did we say the answer is? The answer is, it depends. If the child continues the wicked ways of the parent, then the child will get punished for the wicked ways of himself and of his parents. Cumulative, double. Whereas if a child does not continue the ways of his parents, in the, his wicked ways of his parents, then he won't get punished for his parents' actions. So what does that mean? A tzaddik ben rasha will not get punished for the sin of his father. 
It's a problem with this answer that Rabbi Yochanan is telling us. Rabbi Yochanan is telling us that that's why you have good people suffering because of his father. No, we just said that if a, a, a person is good, breaking away from the habits of his father, he won't suffer. So the Gemara gives us answer number two. This is what he actually meant to say. We're rejecting answer number one. A answer number one is not correct, but this is the answer. Tzadik betovlo, a righteous person that has good fortune, Sadiq gamur, is a righteous person that is completely righteous, completely pure. 100% Sadiq. Sadiq veralo, a righteous person that bad things happen to him, Sadiq she'eno gamur. It's a righteous person that's not completely righteous, meaning 99% Sadiq or 98% Sadiq. He did, did some things wrong, so that's what the punishment is coming for. Rasha vetovlo, if it's a wicked person that good things are happening, Rasha she'eno gamur, it's a person that's not pure evil, the person's evil, but not pure evil, there's still some good to the person, so they get good rewards sometimes. Rasha veralo, a wicked person that bad things happen to him, Rasha gamur, is a completely pure evil person, okay? Okay, there's a lot of questions. It's already half hour in. Then we're, we're this is the second answer. Okay, there's there's a lot to discuss here. Let me uh let me do a couple of things. Number one, let's just speak about uh, this concept of of continuing the actions of your of your parents. So there's like a fun story. Rabbi Ben Chaim loves the story. Uh, he says it and uh, he starts cracking up. So like even the first time that he said I didn't understand it. I was just dying of laughter because he because he was. Okay, so but here's what the, the story is. The story is as follows. There's a mashal that the Magim Yudubna says. How there was one day there was a lion. And the lion is sees a fox. So he goes and he grabs the fox. And he, uh, he grabs the fox and he's going to eat it. He's about to eat it. And before he eats it, he's playing with his uh, prey. And he says, if you have any last wishes, anything you want to say, speak now. Forever hold your peace. I'm going to eat you and you're going you're gonna to be gone. So the fox says, hold on, hold on, hold on, what do you want to eat me for? I have nothing. Look at me. I'm just a few bones and I have a furry uh, tail. I have nothing here. You know what? Guess what night it is tonight? Tonight is Pesach. You have to go to the Jews' house. The house of the Jewish people, the night of Pesach, you know, they have all of the best food in the world. They have Shulchan Orech. They have everything you can imagine. The lion's like, what are you, crazy? I'm going to go into their house. They're going to kill me. You think I could just walk into the house? They have, they have their weapons. They have their swords. They have their knives. They have their guns. They're going to kill me. I can't just walk into their house and, and go, like, you're in my hands. I'm going to eat you. He says, no, 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 no. You don't know. There's a pasuk in the Torah for the Jewish, pe Jewish people. What does it say? It says, poket avon avot al banim. Hashem takes the sin of the father and takes it out on the child. So don't worry. You go in. They're not going to hurt you. They'll take it out on your child. Says, really? Yeah, the Torah says Hashem punishes the child for the sin of the father. So you go in, steal their food. They're not going to punish you, lion. They're going to punish your child. And he says, oh, okay, it's a free meal. I'll go in. The Pasuk says they're not going to punish me. They're going to punish my child. So I'll go in and I'll go eat. So what does he do? He goes right in. He tries. He lets go of the fox. And he goes into the house. And lo and behold, they all take out their guns. They all take out their knives. They start beating it. And they're whacking it on the head. They shoot at it. It took a bullet. And he ran out of there. He ran out of there. He's all nekavim, nekavim, chalulim, chalulim. He's, uh, he's uh, destroyed and he's injured. And guess, uh, as he's like lying there, guess who he sees? He sees the fox. The fox comes and says, you fox, you told me that they're not going to punish me for my sin. He's like, no, 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 they didn't. They didn't. They can't. It says in the Torah, they won't. He says, you kidding me? Look at me. I'm all ripped up. He's like, oh, that's for the sin of your father. Your father went into their house. And April, now that's, they were punishing you for them, not for you. Okay? So that's the mashal. That he got punished for his father with this. Hey, what's the nimsha? The way the Magami Dovna explains is that this fa this lion was told that if you go do this, your children will suffer. And did he care? No, he didn't care. He's gonna do something, his children will suffer, and he didn't care. And what did he do? He was willing to go, even though it's gonna ruin the life of his children. So what does Hashem say? Midah can I get midah? If you don't care about your children, then I, the same way how you don't care about your children, then I'm going to take any sins that your parents said, I'm going to throw it on you. Because you deserve the, 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 the fact that you don't care about the well-being of your children. The, the, the sins of your father, I'll throw them onto you. Because he shouldn't care about you either. In other words, when someone does something wrong and continues a certain way, it's going to then continue to the next generation, right? The concept of following, following the ways of your parents it's like building a chain. I'm going to do it because he did it. And then the next generation will do it also. 
So it's like you're you're setting your children's lives to be doomed. So if you don't have mercy on the lives of your children, you don't stand up to try to live a better life so your children can live a better life, then Hashem says, I'm going to give the punishment to you also. Whereas if you stand up and fight it, then Hashem says, I'm not going to punish you. Okay, so this is a, a fun mashal. Rabbi Ben Chaim loves it. It's a, it's from the Magid Midovno to explain this concept. Now, why is it fair that if I continue, children continue the ways of the parents? Because when a child continues in the ways of the parents in an evil way, it's like setting up a, a, a lineage of only acting this way. You don't have mercy on your own children. If you're not for yourself, then you give a better life to your children. So since you don't, then Hashem will give you the punishment of the, of the parents onto the child. Okay, so that's number one. I'll be honest, the story is much better than the, than the connection. It's just a fun story. The connection is a little bit, uh, a little bit hard to, to get. This is the story of the Magim and The second answer, the second answer uh, that we're saying here is, okay, we're rejecting the first answer having to do with parents. Instead, we are now saying, you know what? You know why Hashem does good things, uh, gives good things to bad people? Because the person is slightly good. And why does he do bad things to good people? Because the person is slightly bad. There is something bad there. So this is the second answer the Gemara wants to give. The Gemara now basically is saying, you know what? Everything makes sense. Hashem rewards the good and punishes the bad. And if you see some suffering, that must mean the person has some bad. And if you see some good fortune, then that, means, that must mean that the person has some good, something, something small, did one favor for someone. Or maybe did something wrong at some point when they're younger or something, and that's why they're getting punished. The biggest thing that, like Elon said, is like no one knows. You can't question God's ways anymore because you're basically saying how maybe there's a possibility that the person did something wrong at some point, okay? Yes, question? Okay, very good. Very good. So Andrew's asking, but hold on a second. Do you recall a couple of ago where we had Rabbi Yochanan himself, Rabbi Yochanan, that he would walk around with what? Very good. The bone or the tooth of his ch of his child. But which child? His tenth son that he buried. Shalom and Shalom and So he explained to us, or those Gemarot explained to us, that there is a concept of Yisurin Shalahava. Sometimes Hashem punishes the person, not because of sin, but because uh, there's some Ahava aspect of it. If you want to hear more about this, watch a SBM Daily Dose, Mr. Andrew Akimian. He uh, gave a very nice, uh, gave a very nice uh, talk on this. But this um, this concept is how there is another concept here. Okay, so Andrew really, if out of left field or out of a couple of ago, is really pulling another answer. The other answer is maybe the bad that you see is not a punishment. Yeah, there's some bad, but it's not really a punishment. Instead, it could be how there's some Yisurin uh, Shalahava, as we explain, like the concept of a coach. A coach can be picking on someone and pushing someone and, you know, like adding weights to them, not because it's a punishment, but because he wants them to, to push themselves harder. So Andrew just gave a second, uh, another answer. So we really have one answer of the Gemara that says has to do with the parents. That answer is rejected. Here's another answer by saying, like what you said, Mr. Namdar and Mr. Van David, how it's not, the person is not completely pure or completely wicked. Andrew is giving another answer that's going against that and saying, I know it's possible that the person is completely righteous, but they'll still get some punishment because it's Yisrin Shalava. Let me see the next answer, and then we'll pause and we'll debrief. Okay, one more answer. Ready? This one's the best answer. Upliga de Rabbi Meir. And this answer argues with Rabbi Meir. Dama Rabbi Meir. Rabbi Meir has a different answer. His explanation, Shtaim. Not nulo. Hashem answered him for the first two questions, and he said yes. lo not nulo, but he didn't answer him this question. God did not answer the question of why do good things happen to good people. But Rabbi Meir says Hashem did not answer. Remember, Elon, you were asking how does he? Where's his source? There's no source, right? Rabbi Meir argues with him. He says no, there is no answer. There's no answer in the psukim. He said, explain to me your ways. And read the psukim. What does Hashem say in the Torah? This is what it says in the next line. The chanoti et asher achon. I will be gracious to whoever I want to be gracious to. Even if the person is perceived as undeserving. I do what I want. V'richamti et asher arachem. I will have mercy on whoever I decide to have mercy on. This is what the Torah says. The Torah says, I will be gracious to whoever I decide to be gracious to. I will have mercy on whoever I decide to have mercy on to. Which Remir is saying is that he told Moshe, I'm not answering you. 
You want to know why I have mercy and why I have great, why I'm gracious to some people? The, I, I, I'm not explaining myself to you. I, I do what I want. In other words, even though to you, you might not think it makes sense, to me it makes sense, okay? I uh, Or to me, I, I follow my own reasoning. Yes! Yes, this is exactly those areas. This is the exact area where Hashem says, man cannot see me uh, a person will not see me and live. A person cannot understand this. Okay, so I'm going to explain that. First, let me just see what uh, Mr. Basalian's question is. That why is it fair for a child to get punished twice if they continue in the wicked ways of their father? Children grow up to the teachings of their parents. If anything, they are more likely to continue since they learn from their parents. So I think the main answer of your question is the Gemara rejects this concept. The concept of children getting punished for the parents for this is rejected unless they continue in the ways of their parents. And if they continue in the ways of the parents, like I said, the, the way the Gemara is explaining is like you get more attacked on, you know, a person is continuing in the ways of his parents. It's solidifying. Oh, I have to do this because my father did this. It's like solidifying the habit. So Hashem solidifies and gives you more punishment. Okay, this is what the Gemara is telling us. There is a, it's important because tradition is extremely important. Minhagim are extremely important, but you know what they say? Minhag is the same letters as Gehina, right? So Minhag, of course, is something good that we follow. When the Minhag is, it makes sense. When the Minhag is within the realm of Halakha, when there's a there's a good reason behind the Halakha of the Minhag. But if the Minhag is wrong, if they say we have a Minhag to, uh, I don't know, do something wrong, to, we don't we don't keep kosher on this day of the week, right? So that Minhag is not a good Minhag. So you have to you have to understand and appreciate minhagim, appreciate tradition. You have to, but you also have to be uh, what's the word uh, discriminant. You have to think through. You have to decide: is this a, is this is this something that I should continue or not? Okay, let's keep going. Let's keep going. So answer number one: parents. Gemara rejects it, meaning that's why a person might get punished or a person might get reward, even though they seem undeserving. Answer number two is what? They have a little bit. It's not a purely righteous person or a purely wicked person. And that's why they're see, you're seeing things that you don't uh, understand. Answer number three. Uh, okay, you're giving your answer. Hold on, Andrew. Hold on a second. We're not, you're, you're not in the Gemara here. Okay, the answer number, number three is that Hashem did not give him an answer. Hashem did not give him an answer. And now we could say, Andrew, your answer, number four, is Yisrin Shalahaba. Okay, I want to say what some of the commentators explain on this, and then we're going to move on. Yeah. I'm sure you mentioned this before, but there's an idea where, where let's say, uh, like good things happening to bad people, yeah. they've done something to deserve that reward in this world and not the next. Uh huh. Have, have we touched up on that? Okay, so this is very good. So I want let, let me, uh, let me, um, let me just say two things that the commentators say based on this Gemara. So very good. So the first thing is what you're saying. Now, the question is, okay, but if there's some good, this person is this person did some good thing, why is it that Hashem gives that person, gives this Rasha reward in this world? At the end of the day, if they're 99% bad, so their life should be 99% bad and 1% good. And if a person is righteous, then it should be 99% good, 1% bad, but you could have some righteous people, Shalom Eda, that they're suffering their entire life. It's not 99% good. So how would you explain this? So then this is one of the ways the commentators explain is like what you said is, again, there's another dimension. There is reward and punishment in this world. And there's reward and punishment in the world to come. And the way they explain is that the real place for reward and punishment is in the world to come. Let's say there's a wicked person that's completely wicked. Then in the world to come, the person should fully suffer. But they did some good things. So Hashem gives them good fortune in this world to pay off all of the good credit that he has. So he goes to Olam Abba and goes straight to Gaina. That's like one way the commentators explain. Or vice versa. A righteous person is very righteous and they've done one thing that's wrong. So Hashem will make them suffer in this world to clean up their slate. Kabarat Avonot. So then they go to Olam Abba, clean everything that they've, that they've done wrong. They've already paid for, and they go into the world to come. That's one way of explaining it. 
The other way of explaining it is what the Ramban says. The Ramban essentially says uh, the halakha, the Gemara, answer, final answer, very Meir, is how we hold. We hold that we don't understand. Why? Because he says, I have an issue with this answer of there could be a righteous person that's not a tzaddik amur. He says it's impossible. There were many righteous people that were completely righteous and still they had some suffering. And in fact, he asks the question of Eov. Eov, we spoke about this last week. Eov is a book of someone that was completely righteous and he also had suffering. And in the book of Eov, this is where they deal with this. In fact, I mentioned this, how the Gemara Mishael Baba Batra says, one of the opinions says that Eov was not a real person. It was a story of a man who was completely righteous, but he suffered and he had death in his family and he had uh, pain on his body, but he was a righteous person. And there was nothing, he didn't do anything wrong. He didn't do anything wrong, but that's just how the world uh, is. And who was the author of this? According to one opinion, it was Moshe Rabbeinu. Because Moshe Rabbeinu was grappling with this very question. In the book of Eov, the Ramban gives many answers. And in fact, one of the answers that the Ramban gives, now we're going to get a little bit, uh, I think someone asked me about this a couple of weeks. I'll say it now. The Ramban there suggests the answer, cryptically suggests the answer of a Gilgul. I'm going to say this and we're going to move on. This concept of a Gilgul is the concept of reincarnation. Uh, a person comes back into this world, but they had a previous lifetime. Okay, not everyone agrees with this. In fact, the concept of a Gilgul will show up nowhere in the Gemara. Nowhere in the Shas will you find the concept of, of, of a Gilgul. Also, nowhere in the Rambam. In the Rambam, you won't find it. Even the Rambam, who says it, he says it in hint. Sounds like it's something that was like extremely controversial, and he didn't want to go there. But he was saying, oh, this could be one of the answers that, that some people are suggesting to Eov, that there's a previous lifetime. Someone had some past, they did something in a previous lifetime, and because of that, they're getting punished. I don't know. I think if you try to figure all of this out, you might go crazy. If it helps you to um, if it helps you to sleep better at night, to know that maybe this righteous person, there's some past to them, or maybe vice versa. Maybe this wicked person, they had some good past to them. If it helps you to sleep better at night, you just you know the answer is there. But I think the, at the end of it, the Ramban says, the answer the, the real answer is Hashem told Moshe, I'll give mercy to whoever I decide to give mercy to. I will have, be gracious to whoever I decide to be gracious to. I'm not explaining my ways to you. A person will not understand my ways. There is one more element to that answer. Well, I'm going to go a little bit further in the Gemara and then we'll get to it. So there, we're not done with the topic. Okay, David Almani, you, uh, you have some good work to do tonight because... Um, there's a this is a summary. We we have now gone through uh, five answers. Okay, we've given the fi fifth answer with a Gilgul, one of them being Andrews. Now let's keep going because I'm going to give you a sixth answer. Yeah. It, it, uh... No worries. We'll come back. We'll come back. Okay. Vayomer, and Hashem says, Lo tucha lerot et panai. You cannot see my face. I will not. Be, uh, you will not be able to see my face. Tana Mishmed Rabbi Yeshua ben Korcha. First, uh, first thing here is Rabbi Yeshua ben Korcha wants to say, you know why God says you will not see my face? You know why Hashem shut him down? I'll tell you why. Hashem told Moshe the following. When I wanted you to understand me and I wanted you to see me, Lord Atzita, you didn't want to. At the burning bush, it says that Moshe Rabbeinu went toward it. He saw something going on. And it says that he turns his face away. Hashem is saying, I came out. I put myself out there for you. And you turned your face. When I wanted to show myself to you, you didn't want to see. But now you want to see. And you say, I don't want. This is the way the guys and girls are. You know, they're all playing games with each other. And the guy asks the girl out. She says, no. Then all of a sudden she's so interested. Like, I'm not interested in you anymore. When I was interested, you said no. So now they say uh, in Farsi, Bukhar. I'm not going to... I'm not going to come give you now what you want. I wanted something back then. You said no, so now I say no also. Okay, so this is the way Rabbi Yeshua ben Korcha is saying that Hashem is telling him, you know what, I'm not going to explain it to you because I want to do it and you didn't want to hear it. Okay, so it sounds a little bit um, childish, but And there's an opinion that argues with it. Rabbi Yeshua ben Nachmani says, no, that's not how it is. Again, again, there's one opinion that says this, that Hashem, at some point, Moshe Rabbeinu, came with the burning bush, and Hashem wanted him to understand certain things, 
and he pulled himself back. We know that in that whole section, he says, no, I don't want to, no, I don't want to go to Mitzrayim, no, I don't want to, no, and he looked away. So part of that was that Hashem was offering something, and he actually said no. So now Hashem is saying, okay, you said no, you turned it down, I'm not going to give it to you now. But that opinion argues with Rabbi Yonatan. Because of three things that Moshe did at the burning bush, he got the reward of three things. Okay, This is another opinion that says he did three things there, so he got rewarded in three ways. One of the things that he's got rewarded for is turning away. So according to this opinion, it's a good thing that he did because he got rewarded. Let's see. Bishar bayaster Moshe panav as a reward for turning his face away, panim. he merited to have a face that was lit up. When he came back down from Har Sinai, he had a glow on his face, like a shining glow. The Torah says, he had like a shining glow to his face, so much so that people couldn't look at him. So he's saying this is a positive. He's saying, since Moshe Rabbeinu had humility and turned his face away from seeing Hashem, he now has someone whose face is glowing. From the fact that it says that he feared looking toward the burning bush. He had fear. So he merited that now others would fear approaching him. So Moshe Rabbeinu, what did he have to do? He had to put on a mask. Or he had to put some sort of a veil for people to approach him. This is what the Torah tells us. The Torah tells us that he was so such a, on such a high level. There was a glow on his face that he had to cover himself. People weren't able to look at him. That's how much Kiddushah he had. So, since he feared Hashem, not looking at the burning bush, people, as a merit of that, people feared looking at him, so he had to cover himself. Bishar mehabit, from the fact that he, it says that he didn't want to uh, gaze, stare at the burning bush, zakhar le utmunat Adonai yabit. He merited to what Hashem will later tell uh, uh, Aharon and Miriam they'll tell them that he is able to stare at me, he is able to gaze at me which means, this opinion is saying when he hid his face at Har Sina, at uh, the burning bush it was a good thing, and for hiding his face, turning his face away, he merited to have a glowing face, he merited to have people respect his face so much that they wouldn't be able to stare at him, and he merited to be able to see Hashem's face, whatever that means some level of understanding of Hashem that no human has, other than him so that's saying that he, that he, uh, that, so the first answer is that Hashem is like saying, I'm not going to explain it to you because you didn't want to understand before. This answer is saying, no, Hashem did explain things to him. Now here, here's the important thing. Okay, this is going to be the last, the last answer. <laughs> I will remove my hand. <laughs> you will see my back. Let me just explain outside. And I did this last time inside. Let me just explain what the Pesukim say. When Moshe says, <laughs> explain to me your ways. Hashem says to him, Lo yirani adam vachai. A person will not see me and live. Lo panai. You can't see my face. He says his answer of, I'll have mercy on whoever I decide to, and I'll have and I'll be gracious to whoever I decide to. But he says, You will not see my face, but here's what will happen. There's going to be a, a cleft here. There's going to be a cave. You're going to go in the cave. I'm going to cover so you can't see, and I'm going to pass by. After I pass by, I'll remove my hand, and then you'll be able to see my back. You'll see my back. You will not see my face. Okay? Very cryptic. What, Moshe, what Hashem tells Moshe is, you're not going to be able to see my face, but I'll let you see my back. What does that mean? Okay, let's see what the Gemara says, and then I'll explain. This is this is dense topic, okay? It's pretty dense. I'll remove my hand, and you'll see my back. But you won't see my face. This rabbi says, This rabbi says, This says, in the name of Rabbi Shimon Hasida, You know what it means? It means Hashem showed him the back of his tefillin, the not on the back of the tefillin. When he says, You could see my back, it means he showed him the back of the tefillin. I don't know if that makes us more confused. I don't know if it, I would just go back to the question. Like what, what exactly happened when he says that you'll see my back? Okay, telling me that you see the back of my tefillin doesn't really clarify things. So now let me give you two answers, okay? Here's answer number one. The Rambam 
which this is not an answer to the original question. The Rambam explains, uh, this is what's called the anthropomorphism. Again, if I see, has it ever happened to you where you see someone from the back and you say, oh, is that is that so-and-so? And you start walking around and then you look and say, oh, no, it's not them. Sorry. Sorry, I mista I have mistaken you with someone else. Has it ever happened that you're, you're walking and you see someone like, hey, is that who I think it is? Sometimes you're right, but sometimes you're wrong. It's happened to you? It's happened to anyone here? You see someone from the back, you think you know them. Maybe you do, maybe you don't. Okay. It happened to what me in the city today, Rabbi. Okay, it happened to you. I don't know. Who is talking? Mordechai. I thought I saw I thought I saw Adam McKeemian. I could have sworn it was him, and it happened to me in the city. I ran up to the guy, pat him on the back. It wasn't him. It wasn't him. Okay, very good. Okay, he went, he went and patted someone back in the city. You're crazy. What are you? Okay, you got to be careful these days in the city. So you went and you patted someone back in the city, and you see like, oh, sorry. I didn't know who you were. Okay, so that's on the back side. But when you see someone on the front side, more often than not, you know who that person is. Unless the person has like a... Uh, like a twin or a doppelganger or something, but it's very rare. Like right now, I look at everyone in the face. I'm not confusing any of the two of you together because you're seeing someone from the front. Maybe from the back, I might. So the Rambam says, this is what Hashem was telling Moshe Rabbeinu. Moshe, he was telling uh, Moshe Rabbeinu is, you want to understand my ways. You want to understand something. I will not be able to give you the full understanding of me the way you understand someone from the front. I'm not going to give you that clarity when you see someone from the front. But I'll give you something. I'll give you some answer so that you have something to hold on to so that you could see me from the back, which means you sort of know, but not, not really. Which means that Hashem gave him a partial answer. Now, what was that partial answer? The Gemara says, seeing the back of the Tefillin. So one very nice way of understanding that, uh, I read from the, I, I actually I heard in the name of the Khatam Sofer, is that, um, when you look at someone from tef uh, when you look at someone in the front from the tefillin, what do you see? You see there's a strap on one side and you see a strap on the other side. And these two straps look completely distinct, that they're not related, they're not connected. But the Kesher should tefill in the back shows that really it's all coming from the same place. Which means that sometimes we perceive that certain things are more of a harsh. Sometimes we perceive it that it's more with mercy it could look on the right is deen justice on the left you could look with mercy but the answer that i explained hashem explained to him is that i don't i don't wake up on a different side of the bed every morning i don't have i don't have different uh i don't change i don't have different perspectives it's all coming from the same source there isn't a god of good and a god of bad it's all coming from the same place now another way of explaining this so this is where we're going to add this answer to our list this is my favorite answer I have someone in the, he's not here today. My favorite answer is the follows. And I, I read this summer. I forgot where I read it, but it's by far my favorite answer. When Hashem says, you won't see my front, but you'll see my back. What he's doing, what he's really saying is, you want to understand why things happen. You want to understand why good things happen to bad people, bad things. You want to understand my ways. I cannot explain it to you as it's happening. I can't give you live play-by-play -play commentary that you would be seeing my face. Hashem tells Moshe, you're not going to get that understanding. But here's what I will give you. I'll give you that it's possible, potentially, one day when I cover my hand and I'm gone and you only see my back because this is in the past, then you'll say, Hashem was here. I'll know that Hashem was here. In other words, what Hashem is telling him is, you want to understand exactly why what's happening right now? I can't give you that. But what I will give you is maybe one day down the line, you'll be able to look back and say, it was all Minash Shemayim. I understand why this happened. And how many times has it happened to each and every one of us? It happened, it happened to me with many things. Uh, you have something going on, and you're like, why is Hashem doing this to me? And then afterwards you say, but Hashem, that was the best thing in the world that could happen. Someone's job can get, he can get fired from a job. And afterwards, all of a sudden, something better shows up, something closer to home, something that's less stressful, something like this, or in relationships. A guy could be going out with a girl, the girl dumps him, and the guy thinks his life is over. Why would she dump me? Then afterwards, he sees someone that's much better, and he realizes all of these red flags, all of these issues with that girl that he was going out with, that he thought was so good. Hashem saved him. Hashem saved him. He thought it was the worst thing in the world. So Hashem says, I can't give you a play-by-play -play understanding of everything that's going on in this world. Because if I would, life would be senseless. Imagine you understood everything that happened. Okay, the last thing related to this 
is like, let's say you had this x-ray vision. Let's say, let's say you had this ability to understand why everything is happening exactly the second it's happening. Let's say you understood. Someone is getting beat up. Okay? The, the, what? You would say, yeah, the guy deserves it. I see the guy getting beat up. He deserves it. You see someone on the street begging for tzedakah. Someone comes and asks you for tzedakah. You know why this person is poor. Hey, the guy deserves it. What am I going to give you money to change God's will? No, you deserve it. You're not human. A person can't understand Hashem's ways and continue to live in this world. Part of us living in this world is you need to have empathy for someone else and their suffering. Don't say the person deserves it. Say the person needs charity. Give him. You see someone on the floor. Help him up. Not saying you deserve to be on the floor. If you say you deserve to be on the floor, then you're not human anymore. Part of being a human is to care about society, care about others. And so Hashem is saying, I'm not going to strip that humanness away from you. Maybe down the line, one day you'll understand. But right now, you're not supposed to understand. Because if you understand, you won't be human. Okay? I think we spoke about this at length. We covered a lot of good topics. Um, really, this is a sure of its in its own. It's already at 9.30. Okay, let's, uh, let's keep going. Let's see if there's much to cover. Yes. This is it. This is the Gemara of Sadiq Vita Aralo. Yeah, this is it. You are now learning the, the age old question. Now, this topic comes up everywhere. If you look at the art scroll, art scroll has a footnote. Uh, help me find it. Here, art scroll footnote, it's on page 786. It is clearly beyond the scope of these notes to plumb to the depths of the issue. I've never used the word plumb before in my life. Okay, and now I will. Uh, it's beyond the scope of us to get to the depth of these issues. However, for those who would like to pursue it further, there are fo uh, there follows a selection of sources. Eov, its commentaries, the Ramban, Malbim, Satraf Saadia Gaon, the Ramban, Marinivachim, the Ramban, and Shara Gamul, the Kada Kemach, the Rikanati, let's see, Chovota Levavot, Shara Vitachon, then they have Shvile Emuna. Who is that? The Nesiv, the Nesiv, Minarata Maor, Der Hashem, Mikhtam Meliao. There's a ton of sources. This is an age old question. It's a topic that we could discuss at length. Uh, and we did. We spoke about it for an hour. We spoke about this topic for an hour. Um, we didn't cover that much Gemara. So I would like to continue covering the Gemara. At the end of the day, there has to be some level of understanding that we don't understand. That's the, the key of our Gemara. The very mayor says, like, we don't know. Hashem didn't tell him why. And Hashem says, I'll give mercy to whoever I decide to give mercy to. I'm not going to explain everything to you. But Hashem says to Moshe, I'll give you something. That something will be from the back. You won't fully understand me. You'll understand it partially. Because otherwise, you won't be human. And there's different explanations that we gave. Maybe it means that you'll understand that after the fact. Which I really love that answer. Because I think with a certain level of maturity, hopefully what happens is, is that you're able to look back on your past. There's like this big talk by... Uh, Steve Jobs, right, at one of these uh, commencement addresses, that he, you know he had a life of uh, struggles, but he was able to say how only at the end of my life am I able to look back and connect the dots and say this is why this happened and that's why that happened. You can't do it in lifetime. It's only being able to look backwards to connect the dots to be able to understand. So that's this concept of you'll see my back, you'll see me from the backside, which means after the fact you'll be able to understand somewhat. Okay, we're going to do a little bit more and then we'll, uh, we'll wrap up. Okay, here we go. Amar Rabbi Yochanan Mishum Rabbi Yosef called Dibur Vedibur Shiatam Mipi HaKadosh Baruch Hu Letova Anytime Hashem says that He'll do something good Afilu Atana, even if it's on a condition, meaning <clears throat> Hashem says, if this happens, then I'll do that. And that's a good thing. Lo Chazarbo, Hashem will never go back on it. Which means He's going to do the good thing anyway. If Hashem says He'll do something on a condition, then the condition doesn't matter anymore. The second that Hashem says the good thing, that's it, it's going to come true. Okay? Minalan, where do we see this happening? We see this happening with Moshe Rabbeinu in this story. In this story, the sin of the gold, of the golden calf, Hashem tells Moshe Rabbeinu, in Moshe Rabbeinu, Shneemar, Hashem tells him, Heref, Ashmidem, leave me alone, don't argue, don't try to defend Am Yisrael now. I will destroy Am Yisrael, I'll kill them all, and I'm going to start a new nation with you, making you an extremely large nation. So there's a conditional statement here. The conditional statement is that if I destroy all of Am Yisrael, I will make you the largest nation. I will make you the start of the nation. 
אף על גב דבעיה משה רחמי עלה דמיותה ובטלה even though no more question no. even though I, I give you three and that's it I'm not giving you more than that what you're gonna say that what what oh oh you're going on that point okay so let's see what the Gemara says אף על גב דבעיה משה רחמי עלה דמיותה ובטלה even though משה רבינו prayed didn't leave Hashem alone and was mevatel, uh, he canceled, nullified the decree of destroying of Am Yisrael, Afiluachi, even so, okma bizareh, Hashem still kept his promise and made his children extremely um, uh, vast and numerous. Shneemar, as the Pasuk says, this is in Divrei Hayamim, right? This is in Divrei Hayamim, the Pasuk says about Moshe, Bene Moshe, the children of Moshe are Gerishon ve Eliezer. He had two sons, one was Gershom, one was Eliezer. Ayub and Eliezer, the children of Eliezer were Rechavya Harosh, Rechavya was the head, Umei Rechavya, and then the children of Rechavya, which is Moshe's grandson, Ravu Lemala, where so many, Ravu Lemala, where there were, there were so many, it doesn't, it doesn't count that. It just says it's like a, um, a very high number of people. Vitana Rav Yosef, Rav Yosef explains that Lemala, what does it mean that they were there were plenty above Mishishim Ribo, more than sixty thousand people, which means from just this one ch- grandchild of his, he's had over sixty thousand progeny. Atya Ravya Ravya, this pasuk of Ravu, how there were plenty of them. You compare that to somewhere else where it says the word Ravu. It says Ravu by Moshe's grandsons. It says Ravu by um, Bnei Israel. It says here Ravu Lemala that they, they had plenty of children. Moshe Rabbeinu's grandchild had plenty of children. And it says by Bnei Israel, Bnei Israel paru vayishutsu vayirbu vayasku v'milon ma'od. Bnei Israel had many, many children, but when they left Egypt, and there were 600,000 men. So since there were 600,000 men in times of leaving Egypt, it's saying with the generations of Moshe Rabbeinu, there were 600,000. That could be an exaggeration. It doesn't have to be that he actually had 600,000 just from himself. That that most likely is an exaggeration, but it's it, to say how it's an extremely large number. Okay, with that, we have reached the end of the daf. Uh, seven. You know what? No, we should still keep going because the the next piece of the gemara is actually pretty short. So I'm going to keep going. Anyone have to go? If you have to go, you could go. But I'm going to keep going. So we're now turning the daf. We have just finished seven a seven a daf zayin amud aleph. Let me go to my chart here. Uh, okay, so these is the list of statements of Rabbi Yochanan quoting Rabbi Yosef. Moshe, number four was Moshe's three requests. And what is number five? Someone want to tell me what it was? What was statement number five? Rabbi Yochanan, Rabbi Yosef? Okay, very good. Everything that Hashem says will come true. How did I say it? Hashem doesn't rescind rewards even if conditional. Okay, same thing. Hashem doesn't take the reward back. Everything that Hashem says from a reward perspective comes true. So that's the statements of Rabbi Yochanan quoting Rabbi Yosef. And we're done with that. We're now moving to Zayin Amud Bet. In Zayin Amud Bet, we are now going to be quoting Rabbi Yochanan in the name of another rabbi. And we think we go through eight of his statements. So for next year, I'm going to have another one of these charts so that we could review all of his statements as well. By the way, you all have access to this chart. The link is in the in the YouTube video. Okay, let's keep going. Zayin Amud Bet. Amar Rabbi Yochanan, Mishim Rabbi Shimon Ben Yochai. Now we're going to say a list of statements of Rabbi Yochanan quoting Rabbi Shimon Ben Yochai. Miyom Shebara HaKadosh Baruch Hu Et HaOlam. From the time or from the generation that Hashem created the universe, Lo haya adam adon. No one, in the text at least, no one referred to Hashem as Adon or Adonai. Let me explain. When we say the name of Hashem, usually it's spelled as Yud, He, and Vav, and He. Now we read that as Adonai. That's how we read it. But the truth is, that's not the word. It's a yud hey and a vav and a hey. It's a different word. Now, we pronounce it as Adonai, but that's not the word. In the Torah, the first person that refers to Hashem as Adonai, that word of Aleph, Dalet, Nun, Yud, is Abraham Avin. Okay? So, from the time, Yom Barak, Kadosh Baruch Hu from the time Hashem created the universe, Lo Haya Adam Shikarola, Kadosh Baruch Adon, this title of calling of Hashem as Adon, no one used it, and Abraham Avinu did call him. As it says, Vayomar, he says to Hashem, Adonai, that's the word. Aleph, Dalet, Nun, Yud. You see the word Adonai. Elohim, my, uh, the God. How do I know that I will inherit this land of Israel? So this is in Parashat Lech Lecha. Hashem promises to Abraham Avinu that he will inherit the land of Israel. 
the land of Israel is the ancestral land of the Jewish people, given to Abraham Avinu, to Yitzchak Avinu, to Yaakov Avinu, becomes to the land of, of Israel, Eretz Israel. When Hashem tells him that promise, he uses the word Adonai, my master. Now, I want to explain what does that mean. What is what? What do you think is special about the... If, let's say, you know the name of Hashem is Yudhei and Vavei, and you know how to pronounce it, and you call that, you call God that, okay? You call him Yudhei Vavkei. That's what you call Hashem. And then comes Abraham and says, I'm going to call you Adonai. What is the uniqueness that we know about Abraham Avinu? What did Abraham Avinu introduce to the world? Monotheism. What does that mean? The belief in one God. So, if you call Hashem by his name of yud Hey and vav Hey, okay, that's this God. And then there's another God called Zeus. And then there's another God called Victor. What? Bob? Oh, Baal, yes. Or Bob, whatever. They, each one has his own name. So, if, when you call Hashem by his name, it's just saying, okay, this is a God, one of many. But Hashem, but Abraham Avinu doesn't call him by his name. He calls him Adonai, the master, the master of the universe, meaning the one that's above all gods. So he's the one that's introducing that not only is Hashem, does he exist, but he is the God that's the Adon of everything else. That is symbolic of what Abraham Avinu says. Now, you tell me that Adam HaRishon never used that or Noah never did that. It could be how they used the word. But in the text, the first person to use the word Adonai is Abraham Avinu. And that's very symbolic or emblematic of his life's mission to say that Hashem is the Adon over everyone. That's what he's pointing out here. The, why are we saying this? The answer is because we gave a list of five things that Rabbi Yochanan quoted in the name of Rabbi Yosef. We're done with the statements of Rabbi Yochanan in the name of Rabbi Yosef. So now we're moving on to statements of Rabbi Yochanan in the name of Rabbi Shimon Bar Yochai. Completely unrelated except for the fact that we're just on a chain of statements. And the statement that we're quoting now is, he said that the title of Adonai was given first person by Avraham Avinu. Okay? That's not some nice uh, trivia. Ask him, when is the first time it says the word Adonai in the Torah? Most people are going to say, oh, the first parasha. No, there it says yud Hey and vav Hey, or it says Elohim. But where does it say the name of Adonai? Aleph, Dalet, Nun, Yud, Abraham Avinu. Now, is that true? I don't know. I actually didn't get a chance to look it up. But look it up. Test it. See if it's correct. If it's not, I'm sure someone addresses the question. Amarav, Rav now gives a follow-up. And he says, Af Daniel. Later on in history, Daniel, Lo na'ana ela bishvil Avraham. Daniel, later on, has a prayer, and in his prayer, he's invoking this concept. And his tefillot get answered, or, or he's formulating his prayers by using Abraham's words. Shneemar, as it says, Ve'ata, Shema Eloheinu. And now, listen, our Lord, El tefillot avdecha, to the, the prayer of your servant, Ve'el techronav, and to his supplications, and enlighten your eyes on your temple that it is no longer existing. Leman Adonai. For the sake of Adonai. Now, the whole time he's talking to Hashem, he says, Now listen, God, please listen to the, the words of your mass of your servant. Do this for your temple, for your Bet Dash, for the sake of Adonai. What do you mean, sake of Adonai? For, for your sake. The Gemara is saying, it should have said, for your sake. He's talking to Hashem, so it should say, for your sake. But if you see in the Pasuk, it uses the letters of Aleph, Dalet, Nun, Yud. It's unique. He uses this word of Aleph. He doesn't say Yud, Hey, and Vav, Hey. He says Aleph, Dalet, Nun, Yud. Since he does that, Leman, Chami, Ve'ele. Ela, Leman, Avraham, Shikira, Acha, Adon. For the sake of Avraham, who you who was the first person to use this title of yours, of Adonai. So when Daniel says, Hashem, please give us back the Beit HaMikdash, for the sake of Adonai, what he's saying is, for the sake of Abraham Avinu, who used this title of Adonai, because you told him you're going to have this land. You told him we're going to be able to be in here. So give us back the Beit HaMikdash. So this is part of David, uh, Daniel's prayers for the Beit HaMikdash to, uh, to be re returned. Okay, so that's the first statement. So next statement, it's a statement we already learned. Let me go back to, to this. Can anyone remind me? Uh, statement number two. What is statement number two here? It's not that hard. I'm just asking you to read. What is statement number two? Right. We said, how do you know that you shouldn't appease someone when they're angry? Does anyone remember the source? The text that we use as a proof that you shouldn't appease someone while they're angry? There was a text. 
Uh, exactly. He says, uh, Hashem tells Moshe Rabbeinu, uh, give me, let, let me uh, cool down. Okay, let, give me some time and then come ask me what you want. And then the Gemara's response to that was, what? Moshe, Hashem gets angry? He says, yeah, he gets angry every single day for a rega. That's what, that, what Gemara was. But what he says there is that Hashem says, uh, uh, what does he say? He says, give me, a, give me some time so I can cool off. So you learn from there that you shouldn't try to um, appease someone while they're angry. That was Rabbi Yochanan quoting Rabbi Yosef. Guess what? Rabbi Yochanan also said this, quoting Rabbi Shimon Bar Yochai. So this appears as statement number two of our next list of Rabbi Yochanan quoting Mishim Rabbi Yosef. So when I, when I, for the, this is Daf 7a. When we do Daf 7b, we're going to have a list of statements of Rabbi Yochanan quoting. You know what? I'm going to get this started so you can see what I'm going to do. Duplicate. I'm going to come here and I'm going to call this Daf 7b. And I'm going to remove two. I'll remove one. Actually, we'll do one together. What is number one? What was statement number one? Okay, Aleph Dalad Nun Yud, Adonai. Okay, statement number two, I'm not touching it. It's the same thing. It's actually that Rabbi Yochanan heard the statement by Rabbi Yosef, and he heard the statement by Rabbi Shimon Bar Yochai, so he taught it. Let's go ahead and see it. We should know this already. Now in the name of Rabbi Shimon Bar Yochai, How do you know that you don't try to appease someone in the time of their anger? He's saying, let my anger pass, and then I will uh, give you what you're, what you're desiring. Then I will give you rest, then we'll talk through whatever it is that you want, but not now. Okay? Sorry? So Rabbi Yochanan heard it from two different people. He heard it from one rabbi, Rabbi Yosef, and he heard it from another rabbi, Shimon Bar Yochai. So he's keeping true to the statements. When he's going through a list of quotes of Rabbi Shimon Bar Yochai, he gives it. And when he goes through a list of quotes from Rabbi Yosef, he gives it. This is what uh, the way the commentators is explaining. So that's statements number one, statements number two. We'll stop here. There's more. I believe this one is going to be, actually I have to change this, right? Quoting who? Rabbi Shimon Bar Yochai. Okay? Let's make this bigger. We'll have this ready for next week. So I'll change the name of the tab as well. Very good. Statements of, actually, I'll just do it like this because I didn't put everything. Statements of Rabbi Yochanan 1. Statements of Rabbi Yochanan 2. Okay? This is the name of Rabbi Shimon Bar Yochai. Okay, so just a quick recap. Tonight's shiur the, the most important, or I guess we spend an hour talking about the question of why do good things happen to good people, good things happen to bad people, bad things happen to good people, bad things happen to bad people. I want to see if we can, in the next four minutes, give a recap of the five answers, maybe six answers that we gave as a group, okay? Raise your hands, though. And I want to see a different hand every time, okay? Different answers? Go ahead, Cody. Okay, so it's on account of the parents. A righteous person that's suffering is because his parent was wicked. Or... A, a wicked person that's enjoying good fortune is because he had a tzaddik as a father. Okay, that's the first answer. Okay? Yes, answer number two. Very good. Rabbi Meir says, Hashem didn't give the answer, so we do not understand why. It's something that we simply cannot comprehend. Okay, that's another answer. Aha. Uh -huh. Not that everyone has, but exactly how... The there the punishment will come. The, the righteous that is pure righteous will never get any suffering. Sadiq Gamur. But if it's Sadiq Shaino Gamur, that if he's has some, he's not completely pure, but he has something wrong with him, so that's why he'll get punished, or vice versa with the righteous, is with the wicked. If the wicked is not purely wicked, but there's some good, then he'll get that reward. Very good, Ariel. That's the third answer. Next, Josh. Ah, uh, so that's so, okay, so he said it has to do with the parents. And when we said it has to do with the parents, the Gemara challenges that. The Gemara says, is that really the case? Because we have this Gemara, this Sukim, that says Hashem won't punish the kids. And we said, no, Hashem will punish the kids if he follows the footsteps of the parents. So Hashem will. The problem here is that our Gemara is talking about a Sadiq bin Rasha, someone who is not following the footsteps of the answer. So that's that's a the, the part of the challenge that we had on the first answer. Yes. Elliot? 
Okay, Hashem will show us back, but will not show us front. Very good, but that's that, that answer still needs some elaboration. What does it mean when it says that Hashem will show us his back and not his front? Very good, very good. As it's happening live, as it's in real time, when Hashem is there, you cannot see Hashem's front. You cannot understand Hashem's ways as it's happening. But you, you can potentially understand it after the fact. Now, it's worth noting that you also, it's possible that you won't understand it, ever. But it's possible that sometimes we'll understand it when it's, Hashem, uh, when it's Hashem's back, meaning after the fact, we'll be able to reflect on it and say, okay, again, there's no guarantees. Yes, another, one, another answer? You, you're good? You have your answer, though. Yeah. No, you have to, it's not even like a it's your answer. So you have to say, who else is going to say it? Me? Okay, very good. So Andrew is quoting what he said um, earlier in this year that there is this concept of Yisrin Shalahava, which we already introduced. Our Gemara here did not say it, but we know that Gemara, that concept exists. Uh, sometimes there's something that we perceive as bad, but it's not really bad. It's suffering coming out of love or affliction out of love because it's some sort of. Um, Training process, challenging this person to refine, to be refined, and to to become better. Okay. Was there any other answer? No, I think we went. Yeah. Oh, the Ramban's hinted answer in the book of Yov, the Gilgul answer, the concept of reincarnation that perhaps it's previous lifetime. Yes. There was also the answer of like you can't know you need to like retain your humanity. Uh huh. Very good. So that falls in line with the answer of like what Ben said. The answer that Hashem says, I'm not going to explain it to you. I'm not, I'm not, meaning that Rabbi Meir tells us that Hashem didn't give him this answer. Within that, when he says, Lo yirani adam bachai, a person cannot see me and live. When you say, a person cannot see me and live, there's two ways of explaining that. It could be where Hashem says, I could tell you, but then I'd have to kill you. Right? They're like in the movies. Or it could be how if you were to understand, you would not live among society because you would know too much. You would have x-ray vision. Someone would be on the floor and he would say, you deserve it. I'm not going to help you. You know, and so you can't, that, that's not a way of living society. So that fits in as an explanation of that answer. Very good. Okay, I think we did a full survey. There, there are even more answers. As, as uh, in the names of the art school, in the words of the art school, it's beyond the scope of this year to plumb to the depths of this uh, topic. But I think we we did it justice. I think we covered a couple of things. And I, I encourage you to do some you know, more research. If anyone has additional answers, please feel free to share with the chat and we'll uh we'll uh continue the conversation that way. Azak Baruch, have a great week, everyone. Azak Baruch. Good night, everyone.